Hi, I'm Melissa Errico, and I am going to have a chat with one of my favorite people in show business. So I'm going to read a little introduction. This is one of the great um, opportunities, really, uh, for all of us to hear um, Miss Betty Buckley in person to share some thoughts. Look, at there she is. <laughs> this is amazing. One of theater's most respected and legendary leading ladies, Betty Buckley's career as a singer and actress spans theater, film, television, and concert halls around the world. And yet tucked away in the corner of Northwest Pennsylvania, she has discovered a haven of creativity and hospitality at Mercyhurst University. In the summer of 2021, she headlined the Mercyhurst Institute of the Arts and Cultures Summer Soiree. She returned in the fall of 2022 to conduct a week-long workshop for students and to perform a second concert. And in June 2023, she became an artist in residence at the university. Yay. <laughs> she returns to campus for a week-long workshop, April 14 to 18, and a public concert at Walker Recital recital hall on friday april 19th at 7 30 p.m so this is a friend of mercyhurst we all love brett johnson who brings together wonderful people and um we're going to give you an educational video i hope uh and lift your spirits and uh as uh, Brett tells me he likes to galvanize the intellect, stimulate the imagination, and encourage the free exchange of ideas. Betty is um, a woman who practices her craft uh, like nobody in the absolute world, uh, a world-class performer, and so this has a real educational value, and I'm really honored to guide um to guide her in a little bit of a chat. So welcome, Miss Betty Buckley. Hello, Melissa. <laughs> this is one of my favorite, favorite singer actresses people in the world. So I'm very delighted. Hey, Kath. Kath, can I have some more coffee? Sorry. Some Sorry. more coffee. Yeah, she's gonna need some coffee. More coffee. I need some yeah. speed. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with Melissa. Hard, you know, hard to keep up with coffee. Melissa. You need yeah. a second cup of coffee. Yeah, don't worry. You can just keep drinking that coffee. So um Maybe just to um, uh, just to begin, uh, I know you really love Mercyhurst, and so that's why you're willing to to um, to talk. And I'm sure you have had a terrific time working with the students. So um, feel free to branch off at any point about Mercyhurst or the the what you think that they're learning there. Um, but from my perspective, just as a fellow uh, musical theater singer and someone who looks up to you as a concert artist and a music maker, and, in, and uh, I think you're like the Joni Mitchell of our business. You're the oh, great- Oh man, oh gosh. No, no, you oh are gosh. Where Joni, you are where Joni Mitchell meets Betty Buckley meets, you know, unique. And, um, uh, but how do you compose? Let's just break things down into small pieces. Cause one of the uh, things I think that we can always, uh, agree on as actors is that you don't know a character you don't have the play and control you can't control a film you can control the the um, parts the pieces uh, you can break down the craft into small moments even this interview who the heck knows how it will go we'll just go moment to moment and that's um, how we work as artists how do you compose let's say a set list someone says to you um, putting together a group of songs do you look at the season do you look at where you're at personally uh, do you look for a narrative? Do you just find an emotion leads the way? I'm sure it's many things, but like what comes to mind when you think of that question like that? You know, you can talk in circles. It doesn't. It's happen. always pretty daunting because it's always like years and years ago when I first started doing concert and cabaret work, there were a couple of artists um, that were on the scene that did these really highly constructed shows, you know, and they were very thematic and they were about the historical references of songs and stuff. And I mean, I would go to see them like on Andrea Markovic, who was one. Mary, and Mary Claire Heron, right? Mary Claire Heron. <laughs> and, yeah. so, and there was this critic, Bob, was it Bob Harrington? Is that his name? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It was at backstage or something. And, and he, every time I would do something, he would go, this is not cabaret. And I was like so annoyed because I was like, cabaret, a cabaret is a place. It's a place where you can buy beverages and some food and you sit and you watch a performer, you know, sing and create a music and an atmosphere, you know, that's uh, conducive for your evening out. And 
I couldn't understand that they were defining cabaret as an art form. And that, that would really annoy me. And I also felt the pressure as I did in university of having to do these themes, right? To write a, like write a paper or something, which you are very good at. You're the, you're the modern day, uh, I mean, you, you always have a theme and a story and it's all aligned and you've, write, you've written your, your show, you know? I, I don't feel comfortable doing that and it's- um, I used to not do that, by the way, and I got I got mauled for not doing it. I know people I used to like, come out and sing Van Morrison, and people, you know, at my opening number with your friend Cliff Carter at the piano. I you love know, Cliff like, Carter. I know, but we would just meander into like all this stuff, and I would lie on the piano and just do whatever I wanted, and I would just get killed by like Stephen Holden in the in the New York Times. He'd be oh, like, Stephen "What, Holden what is she so, doing?" You know, he was so tough, and he had his favorites like Mary Claire Heron. <laughs> and, um, and and I, it drove me nuts. It drove me nuts. You know, um, I mean, literally nuts. My first venture to the Cafe Carlisle was to sub for Eartha Kitt uh, when she was out sick. So I went in to do a few shows for her while she was getting better. And there was this humongous New York snowstorm. So of course we only had like a handful of people there because it was everybody was snowed in, but. Um, yeah, and so Stephen Holden through the years would give me these really bad reviews and it would just kill me, kill me. And then this other critic was saying that I what I did wasn't cabaret. And so I was like, yeah, you're right. Cabaret is a place, it's not an art form. And I'm doing concert work with these phenomenal musicians. And I'm, I put together beautiful songs that inspire me with these phenomenal jazz musicians. And uh, years ago, my friend Michelle Columbier, who was a very renowned French composer, who did an album called Wings that all these guys in the jazz um, scene were very admiring of. And I, I met him when I was in LA and um, he, uh, he did my first set of uh, orchestrations for my first Carnegie Hall concert. And he said to me years ago, he said, Betty, in terms of concert work and um, your public appearances and cabaret work, whatever, you just always guarantee them a beautiful musical experience. Make sure that you've you've given them that, and you'll become known for that. And I was like, yeah, that's right. That's what I do. Right, right. And I, I'm enough of this theme business. I had I had enough of that in college. You know, it's like I don't want, I don't yeah. want to write themes. Um, so generally what I've done in the past is whatever occurs to me, like songs that just like, I'll hear a song, I don't know, on the radio or, you know, um, in a store and I'll be moved by it. And then I'll go look for it or in a, at a restaurant or something. I mean, just in my daily journey, I'll go find it and then try it and see if it's something I can do. Like <laughs> what's, I fell in love with that song, These Dreams by Heart. You know, those girls, those amazing <laughs> guitar players, too. Uh, the Wilson sisters. And um, so I tried and tried to do an arrangement of These Dreams. And because I just was so struck by that song. And it was really the, the arrangement and the production of the recording that I was in love with. And I couldn't recreate that. Mm -hmm. But the song itself was just a pastiche. It was just like was this little, little something, image, this little image, this little image, but it didn't have, uh, I'm better at songs where I can tell a story, where I can be, where I feel I know the character, I can bring something of um, a storyline to the material. I was going to ask you that next. Like, do you do you when you're when you're doing these concerts? Mm -hmm. I would imagine that as much as you love to explore jazz and you love to explore the pop or things you hear on the radio and stuff, both your instincts would lead you to some theater music and also the demands of the audience. Yeah, sometimes you'd be singing maybe a theater song from a show or never. I can't <laughs> believe you're asking me this question today because I'm trying to put together the set list for Mercyhurst. Uh, and I having done two concerts prior, we've got my set list from those that I'm going through because I don't want to, you know, do a lot of repeats. But on the other hand, there are songs that I simply love to do that, you know, I like the experience. And these are just with my wonderful pianist, music director, collaborator, Christian Jacob. Right. 
Uh, some shows I do with just him, some I do with a trio, um, and then some with a quartet where we, you know, some piano, bass, and drums, or piano, bass, drums, guitar. And so that selection of songs has very much to do with who the musicians are and what can stand alone outside of, you know, a rhythm section. Um, are you yeah. in theater music at all? Well, yeah, okay, your question. I can't believe this interview today of all days because this is my dilemma. This yeah. is my dilemma. I understand. I just, I just did a concert in um, at Sagerstrom Center that was a birthday celebration of uh, Sondheim and Andrew Lloyd Webber. I just mm -hmm. find it uncanny that their birthdays are on the same day. Isn't that I the know. coolest? Yeah, it's also my birthday. Cool. Yeah. It's very interesting. And so, uh, Scott Coulter was putting together that concert with these great, great singers, uh, friends of mine. Um, and um, I, I haven't done a concert for over like a year, almost a year and a half, because I had a really rough year physically. I had RSV, long COVID, pneumonia, a knee replacement, um, just all kinds of issues, physical issues over the past year and a half. So I've been working really hard over the past several months to get strong again and to rehab my voice, which when you when you don't sing, you have a lot of work to do to get that back. I remember seeing how fit you got for Hello Dolly. You were the epitome of health. I remember watching you launch into your training and I was somewhat around your orbit at that time. And I was so impressed by how you know what physical fitness you need to perform, especially that often. But we can we can get to that later. But um, there's nobody as disciplined as you. So do you're feeling better and good? Well, now? it's that's thank you for the compliment, but that's not true. I when I have a, when I have to when I have to do it, that's when I do it. Right. But if I don't do it, I mean, if I don't have that impetus or that requirement. I'm a couch potato and I won't sit around and watch Korean television. That's my <laughs> obsession. I love, I love BTS and uh, all the, those, you know, Korean kids and these Korean actors and Korean filmmaking. I just think it's out of this world. I love it so much. And that's what I've been doing for the past year. Because you have your filmmaking thing going now, which yeah, is- Yeah, yeah, I did that too. I did that yeah, too, so, yeah, so yeah. I kept a hand in. But this concert business, you've got to be, well, you know, you have to be so, the best work I've ever done um, is because I've been so f strong physically, like mm -hmm. the stamina required and like Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> I trained like a world-class athlete. It was insane. And I was- I saw you in London and I came backstage. You were the, literally the greatest performance I've ever seen in my life. I was, oh I'll never forget that. I went to your dressing room and you were incredible, but the, you were incredible on stage, more important. And um, wow, that was, you just are the most exotic and beautiful, strong actress on earth. But thank you, thank you, thank um, you, thank you. So yeah, it so when you're choosing- as you know, a lot of work. Oh, so. well, I don't even know, but you-, well, you I'm, I'm answering your question. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, the, to get ready, I was only doing five songs at Segerstrom for, for this birthday celebration of Sondheim and Bob. Yeah. And thank God it was only five and I didn't have to hold down the whole concert. Um, so just, but they were those five, they were like three of the 11 o'clock numbers and two, you know, uh, ballads. And I haven't, those songs I don't do in concert because they're so physically like it was fine when i was in my 30s and when i was in my 40s and even my 50s but i'm 76 and the the requirement to sing memory or as if we never say goodbye those big big songs i like i just think about them and i like i want to faint basically and um i can't believe i'm telling you this but it's just there when i was 35 all of the songs <clears throat> that i love to sing were, you know, cries of the heart, a cri de corps, you know, like, a, is that how you say it, cri de corps? That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and that's what I felt, just this like, uh, you know, about life, about love, about the passion, about, you know, and there, I always had this tremendous ambition to be a really, a really strong, good singer, good storyteller. And I just, you know, as the years go by, I don't know. I don't care anymore like that. It's like, I don't, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. And that's one of the nice things about getting older is that you no longer feel the need to, uh, you know, to really um, 
So to pick that material up again, I mean, memory is so beautiful. I love it. It's the jewel of my collection. And as if we never said goodbye, it's just a stunning piece, you know. I mean, all those songs, I love them. And you you sing them all, you know, for Sondheim. It just like, it's it's such an accomplishment what you're doing. It's such an accomplishment. And I'm like awestruck every time I tune in to what you're up to. I'm like, oh, God, look at her. And she's well, like, sometimes not as athletic singing all the time, actually. Are you I mean, kidding? It's like gymnastic. It's like mental it's gymnastics. Like, and it's, it's, that's like you know, it's your pitch. Brain. It's different. It's pitch. And it's like it's changing your mind constantly. You know, like I would think Angela Weber, it's kind of one you kind of like Michelle Legrand, you kind of go in this direction. You may go towards things as a journey, but sometimes you go two directions. You go over here. I love, I love his ambivalence. I love Sondheim's yes. ambivalence. It's so like beautiful. everything discounts everything else. You say one thing, you know, everybody loves Louis. I mean, you have to be insane to sing that song. And it, so it suits me. Um, yeah. I like the complexity of, of, of him, but it's- Yeah, but you're like a puzzle solver, you know, and so is he, the crossword puzzles and stuff. Yeah. And I just, I, I'm fascinated by the skill that that takes. And I love, love, love the songs. After he died, I released all, you know, all that I could find of my Sondheim recordings through the years. And I was listening back to that collection. I was really proud of it. I thought, wow, I, I really sang a lot of those because I get so gobsmacked by what you're doing. And then I get like, oh, my God, you know, look at what she's doing. And then I'm like, well, Betty Lynn, you did that when you were younger. And I'm you like, yeah, but not to that degree. <laughs> you're, you're, what I'm doing, actually, is that I'm a, I'm a pupil in a way of yours because. No. You, uh, no, yes, because you reinterpret music. I mean, we're, we're going around this, I, this first and, and second set list question because it's like, do you uh, choose to concertize with music that's embedded into a show into a into a character that you have played or do you kind of um pull it out of that context into a new musical landscape which is the world of your unique betty imagination uh, mm -hmm. which is jazz and has folk and funk and pop and everything mm -hmm. else in it i think it sounds like you're not sure it's, it's like it's a constant balance well it's it's well you know i just feel like of course you want your audience to be happy and to feel really you know, happy that they've come, happy that they bought the ticket and you want them to feel fulfilled. And then, so what happened was after I did that concert at Sagerstrom and I did As If We Never Said Goodbye, Not A Day Goes By, No One Is Alone, Sending The Clowns and Memory. And it was a nice little set, um, but I was shocked. Like when I went on for my sound check, there was this big, big concert hall in uh, Costa Mesa beautiful beautiful acoustics unfortunately my team was there my sound guy I can't work without my sound guy terry gabus and then christian was there and trey henry and ray brinker my la guys um you know they're they're just so great and then we had this beautiful string and you know woodwind section um and christian had written these new arrangements and so um <laughs> I, I couldn't believe even for the sound check, I was so overwhelmed by the lights in this place. And I was just like, oh, and I came off stage and I was like, oh my God, that's why you have to be strong. You just have to be so strong physically and uh, so practiced mentally and emotionally that you can just stand there and let yourself be an instrument of people's experience, you know, um, and the, an instrument of the music. Thank God I've had the teachers I've had. And so I, I was grateful as I did the sound check, I was like, all my training kicked in. And then when I did the show, the same thing happened. And I was just overwhelmed at the energy from the audience. And I came off stage and I was just like, oh my God. And I was so grateful it was only five songs, you know? So then suddenly people are writing me or they're posting online, oh, she did memory. She did as if we never say goodbye. And then people are messaging me, are you going to do memory? Are you going to do your Broadway songs? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I haven't sung them for years. And I, you know, I don't. And so there's this conflict. And so my wonderful assistant, Kathy, who's worked with me for 24 years, you know, and she helps me put all my, you know, collate the music and when I'm doing new material, find the lyrics and, you know, we communicate with Christian. So that's what we're, I'm doing right now to prepare for the Joe's pub engagement, which I'm doing in May. I'm doing six shows and I'm really 
completely daunted by the idea of three nights of two shows a night. You know, I'm like, oh my God. So I'm really working. Yeah, I'm working really hard to be in that kind of shape. Right after we finish, I have a voice lesson with um, our teacher, Joan Later, on Zoom. Um, so regarding the Mercyhurst set list, I'm looking at the sets that I did before and I'm considering a couple of the new songs that I'm working on with Christian for Joe's Pub. And um, I'm in debate with myself about these past Broadway um, songs. And uh, my, inc my it always says since I was a kid, so a young singer, I'm like, don't tell me what to sing. Like in the past, agents would book me and they would say, well, they want this repertoire. And I'm like, no, you don't get to tell me what to sing. Well, you don't have to tell me what you're going to do at Mercy Harris, but I like that we shared with the listeners that there's this um, conflict for you sometimes, which is that you are a theater actress. And so a theater actress serves the play and then serves everybody's memories of having come and seen that play. And so how much is your job to recreate their memory of how much they enjoy? I don't, I don't like the pressure of that. I know I should add as a professional performer, I know that 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 should be really important. But I I just feel like you must take into account. I every age, I'm a different person. The person I was at 35, I'm very different at 45. I'm very different still at 55. At 76, I'm a completely different human being. And um, thankfully, some of my skills are still in decent shape. Um, and the, the biggest thing that I think I can share with aspiring singer actors is find the best teachers you can find and stick with them and, and keep working on your actual instrument. You know, because years ago when I studied with Paul Gabbert, I studied with him for 19 and a half years. Great, great um, teacher. And he also trained Joan, our teacher. And uh, he said, you can sing all your life, Betty, if you take care of yourself, because the voice follows. The voice follows who you are. The voice follows what you think. The voice follows how you feel hmm. about yourself and the world around you. The voice follows. And so I keep remembering that in these days of becoming an older, uh, an elder person, an elder statesman, so to speak. Um, but it's like years ago, I stopped singing Meadowlark you know, which I was known for singing in concert. And it was a song that Stephen Schwartz told me he wrote for me, but then he also told Patti LuPone that. <laughs> and, uh, and then when we, con when we were in a conversation about it and we were confronting each other about who it was written for, we both called Stephen Schwartz and he told both of us that he didn't remember. And we were like, oh, we were so... So oh she that part, took it out of her repertoire and I took it out oh. of my Oh, interesting. But, I'm great at that song, but then at the very end, I have to play a recording of you. Just the very last sentence. Like, I'm terrific until the last couple of bars. I need to push the button and play Batty Buckley. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. You're so sweet. I love it until the end. I just, like, can't stand it. But yeah. I, you know, all the only difference is we just... And, and I, I hate that so much. <laughs> I, it's like we, you know, we just sped it up. So, but anyway, I, there's, I don't want to sing metal arc anymore. You know what I mean? It does metal art is for a young woman to sing. It's not for an older 76. It doesn't make any sense. Do you see well, what I'm saying? You can relate to divorce. You have to be a divorcing age and a young man. Well, it's about a, it's about a spark. It's about passion, aspiration. And pa I don't know. So selecting material has to be about what fits you, what you can be authentic in. I can't stand on a stage anymore and sing about something that I don't feel, you know what I, I mean? And I'm yeah. not gonna pretend to be someone I'm not in a concert setting, because that's about who you are, as you know. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, all right, now I'm gonna jump to another sort of, um, uh, thing i've written in the new york times a little bit about like my nightly ritual that i have a problem finding a person to zip me into my gowns um uh <laughs> at, when i'm at my hotels because i'm by myself uh, it, it, it began as a sort of an intimacy, and now it's a kind of a fun ceremony that i track on instagram like who's gonna zip me um what's the weirdest sort of ritual that you have on the road or a superstition or a practice that's before you perform it doesn't have to be getting zipped into your dress is there any ritual well, i always have to meditate I always have to 
uh, arrange my day, you know, I have to work out lighter workouts on the actual concert day. I have to work out, I have to do something really physical, and then I have to shower and vocalize, right? So that happens. I have to eat early so that at least three hours before I sing, I can't go out there and burp my way through, you know. So Let's that do a sound check, right? Do 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 eat. Yeah, you have to do a sound check, and I have to arrange that. So generally, my workout is before the sound check and um, the shower and stuff before that, and vocalize. And then after the sound check, I eat something really light, and then I go and meditate, and you know, or nap, nap and meditate, and then um, get partially dressed, go to the venue with my wonderful assistant. I could not do what you do and travel alone. There's no way. And then, um, so then when I get there and I put my makeup on, I either put my makeup on at the hotel or at the venue, depending. And um, then I do a ritual. Oh, then I do my meditation um, and this kind of surrender ritual where I, you know, just really let everything go and ask that all, you know, whatever insecurities or fears or, um, uh, you know, ill, ill feelings, you know, just be washed away and be transformed into a really one pointed focus uh, for the sake of you know, taking the audience on a journey so that whatever negativity is going on in me is used as a part of the stories that are being told in a positive way for a positive outcome. And then I meet with my band or my pianist and my sound guy and Kathy, and we do a little focus circle and then we do the show and that's it. That's amazing. That's a beautiful <laughs> story. That's a beautiful answer. Um, there are so many uh, bizarre coincidences or happenstances that happen on the road. I was once bit by a dog mm. uh, in Los Angeles. And then the very next day I went to San Francisco um, uh, to perform. And weirdly, I was checked into a dog hotel where people were encouraged to bring their dogs. It was a specialized hotel. So I just had a, I'd just been bitten by a dog. I had a concert in San Francisco and I walked into the place where it was just dogs everywhere, dogs in the elevator, dogs on my bed, like a stuffed animal, dog pictures. It was just one of those weird, it could only happen on the road type of a day. Do you have any um, memories of like a snowstorm that you faced in Idaho or um, any kind of crazy one, you can't believe this concert story that, that comes I've to had, I've had musicians, well, I mean, I sat in airports when planes were canceled and then we had to like frantically find a way to get to the concert venue. I've had musicians like uh, call in at the last second while we're at the airport and say they're not coming because of weather and then scramble around and try to find um an alternate uh, musician uh who fortunately you know um a friend of mine would step in in that case yeah. um my wonderful sound man terry gabus would race to the uh, rent a car and get a van and we'd all haul ass and drive as fast as we could to the venue that's happened um yeah. I can't I can't think what else right right at the moment. What's but. the biggest audience you've ever performed for? Forty nine thousand people. I sang the Star Spangled Banner for the uh, 49ers football game in San uh, Francisco. Where did you play in San Francisco? That particular show that I'm thinking of that was at the Nico. I that love the Nico. Nico. Why weren't you staying at the Nico? What's that? Why didn't you stay at the Nico? Oh, there was a year where it was a dog specialized hotel. Did oh, you know I didn't that? know that. Yeah, they had a whole section of their year that was like, they had, I guess it was some sponsorship or something, that it was dog crazy. I don't think it's always like that. Um, Are you badly bitten? I was actually, I was. Oh, God, did he break the skin and everything? Don't say her last name, but our, don't we share a friend, Isabel? Don't say her last name. It was her dog? It's her dog. Oh, don't God. Say her last name. Her dog, yeah. Um, so, uh, what's well, one day I had a dog incident. We were walking in Great Barrington. Kathy and I were out for a walk to get ready for a concert. And this dog, this wild dog, like scary dog, comes racing across this yard, like, you know, it's going to get us. And Kathy was walking with me and she jumped behind me. <laughs> 
<laughs> which was so funny. And I have this like, as you know, I have this really big voice uh, when I want to use it. And so I just put my feet to the top of my he head yelled, no, so loud. And that dog screeched to a stop, almost like, you know, a cartoon stop and looked at me and I said, get out of here. And he was like, he ran like crazy. It was so funny. But yeah, I, I, I call that my, my big voice, my big girl voice. And, um, and it scared this dog to, to pieces. So. Someone who chase off a shark and just, you know, you're supposed to just tap a shark on the nose. I can, that's all they need is just to be bonked on the nose and you're good. I, I just don't think I could do it. No, well, I wouldn't want him to get that close. You'd be terrified. So tell me a little more about your relationship to your accompanist. Like the, the our uh, great uh, elder, Marilyn May says a girl singer um, is effectively married to her pianist. Um, or to a series of pianists. Is that true for you? And Oh, and yeah, 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 yeah. Um, my pianist for the past, oh, I don't know, over 10 years. I worked with a wonderful pianist, uh, a genius uh, named Kenny Warner for 20 years. And the, the, we did like 10 albums together or something. And he he's a really a, an incredible genius. And we were reaching a, a parting of the ways um, around 9-11. And that just he um, he went through some stuff and you know real tragedy in his family and stuff too, and I felt um, ahead of time that that parting was coming, much to my heart's dismay, uh, because I felt like my music was so tied to what he you know, and he really lent his phenomenal abilities to my interpretation. Of what I would like when I first started working with him, I would bring out art books and say, okay, this song is like this painting by Matisse. And I would say, I want wash, you know, chords that are washes of color. And um, like we did this beautiful arrangement of the very thought of you that was based on a Matisse, you know, Matisse, the, the water lilies. And, um, wow. um, oh no, is that Monet? I, f I forget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's an amazing and uh, it's <laughs> such, but it was always based on, or I would say, Okay, this is the scenario um, in, you know, even with my band, with the sax player, like you're on this like porch in New York playing this like sad, lonely saxophone and um, the girl is upstairs practicing and her voice is, you know, and it's, it's about this. And I shared with, they shared with me their vast musical vocabulary and I shared with them um, color and, um, paintings. In fact, he later did an album called Paintings based on picking material that was to, to convey, a, you know, a mood, a feeling or a color. And so that was based on, you know, our early work together. And ultimately, he knew what, I mean, I find it fascinating that there are chords, there, there are literally, literally studies about this, that there are chords that deliberately invoke in a listener certain emotions, you know, in terms of dissonance and uh, the use of dissonance. And I just find that fascinating that, so my arrangements are uh, uh, built to in evoke a, an experience that an I stand in the middle of, in the center of the arrangement as a character, you know, um, can uh, representing a character's experience or a story to, uh, to so there's a sense of place and a sense of of the story that I now used to diagram the songs or the arrangement for my uh, musicians where you know you there's like this journey where you start here and then maybe you come here and then you talk about Sondheim and that graph would literally be this, you know, of this. And you, so you go through this thing, you come out with a new awareness by the end. And um, I don't know, I have all these little, um, right, you know, as, as I've gotten older, it's not, uh, it's, it's all just an intuition at this point, you know, which was, was what I was so pleased to discover at Sagerstrom is the minute I walked on stage and for the sound check and for the performance, all of that practice with this, you know, our great teachers and the studies that I've done through the years of meditation and spiritual philosophy and the vast amount of experience that I've 
you know, collected since I was 11 years old, performing constantly since I was 11 and professionally since I was 15. All of that experience just kicks in and I'm just there watching the whole thing happen. And I'm like, that's so amazing to me. And I, I feel so appreciative, humbled and appreciative that I, that life has taken me through such a journey and that I've had the wherewithal to find the teachers that would help me um, uh, learn all these things. And it's a myriad of details, a myriad of details of every single performing experience you've ever had with every great director you've ever worked with and every great musician you've ever been privileged to work with or hear. Um, like, you know, the, the great concert artists that affected me so profoundly was I got standing room for Sarah Vaughn at Lincoln Center when I was a really young singer on Broadway. And I was in the back of the Lincoln Center and she comes on and she was older. And um, this has been like my go-to inspiration from that moment. And she had these three, this trio of musicians that were also older that had clearly worked with her for a million years, you know, and you were just like, wow, this is so cool. And she sang, uh, everything must change. And the audience was literally breathless after that performance. And I was like, oh, you know, and I just was like, I want to do that. I want to be that when I'm older. I want to be able to walk on a stage with guys I've worked with forever and make audiences feel like that. That's what I want to do. And that's when I decided I would become a concert artist. Theater, theater music in general is not like everything must change it's so internal and there's so much texture and music around it like i don't i believe you you are that but it's it, it's 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 interesting like you take all that sensitivity sensuality spirituality that you've developed and then you say the other day you were doing memory or you were doing the theater song it's it's not the same musical space and yet you inhabited theater music with all of that uh, yeah. uh awareness do you miss the jazziness when you're doing the more straight music you know no because um <clears throat> my memory chart as i've been doing it since i was 35 years old i don't do the original um, Michel Columbier, the musician that I mentioned to you, the French composer that did my first concert uh, charts for Carnegie Hall, he wrote my memory chart. And my memory chart is like these beautiful pooly chords that just set up the space, set up the place. Wow. And I mean, I walk out there, I hear that music and I'm immediately in that place of then. And I see exactly what I saw for a year and a half in the Winter Garden Theater. It's like it's a it's a place and the, everything in that place remains the same the moon the people in the distant the voices the leaves around my feet the people over here the the sun coming up on the horizon it's exactly the same and i just witness it and talk and describe it as the song does um it's funny though regarding our mutual um hero stephen sondheim when I was working with Kenny all those years ago, um, and we had this Michelle Columbier chart of memory and stuff, and we had we took on for our first album, our record company that signed us because of the concerts we were doing at the bottom line in New York, uh, said, well, of course we want a Broadway repertoire. And so we did Broadway, but we rearranged it like big time. <laughs> and How did that everybody's, happen? Everybody said, like Kenny, when we first did them in concert, would say, you know, people aren't going to get this at the beginning. And sure enough, we just got like, and he said, until they hear it on a record and can live with it. And so we got trashed by some reviewers as, you know, being the sacrilegious people who would go, you know, rearrange this, these like amazing Broadway songs. But they're they're full, excuse my language, they're, they're really, they're really so beautiful. I mean, those charts are so stunning. And sure enough, when the album came out, the re same reviewers that had trashed us in concert had sat down to listen to them and got what we were trying to do, which was these paintings. And uh, 
so, and I've been so fortunate. Well, towards the end of my relationship with Kenny, I found Christian Jacob as a part of the Tierney Sutton band. And I called him, I got his number through the musicians union because he has that same evocative dissonant palette of beautiful uh, chords uh, that I can just live in. And um, I asked him if he worked with other girl singers and he said he did. So he started working with me. And so that was a fairly smooth transition when Kenny and I ended our relationship. And Christian is like a divine musician. He scored two of Clint Eastwood's uh, films. And so when to respond to your question, my arrangements are interpreted by jazz musicians. And um, in some cases, there are uh, like Not A Day Goes By, new arrangement, not No One Is Alone, new arrangement, um, as if we never said goodbye, done interpretively as I tell them to, <laughs> or I, I request them to do. Uh, memory, not the Broadway, or in fact, the first time we did a, oh my God, we did a, a memorial service that Andrew was was there. Uh, I think it was for, I think it was for Bernie Jacobs. And um, so we did, we did my version of memory, which, which I refer to as space memory. And <laughs> I have a, there's a funny story about that too. And uh, Andrew was sitting on stage in the first chords that they played. Andrew's like, like, <laughs> looks over, like, what are we doing? <laughs> and I was, I just felt like such so, so this kind of inner glee about, you know, kind of blowing his mind because he'd never heard the arrangement as I do it, I guess. But anyway, I, I like that we do that. And, but Sondheim came to see me in, um, in, in Sunset Boulevard in London, he came to a matinee and he came backstage afterwards. And I was so thrilled. We were all so thrilled to hear that he was in the theater. And he comes back uh, with some other people and um, he's like, yeah, it's good, it's good. And kind of dismissed me and then went over to the corner of my beautiful apartment sized dressing room in the Adelphi Theater. It was an incredible place and was playing with my dog the whole time while I was talking to these people. So finally I got the courage to, and I'd sung for him in benefit concerts and stuff, uh, birthday celebration concerts. And I'd also uh, work for him uh, as the original witch in Into the Woods for the first workshop and then the pre-Broadway workshop. And so I'd had these lovely conversations with him, weird conversations with him, uh, these moments in my life. Um, and he, he's like, just to ignore me, basically. And I went up to him and I said, Mr. Sondheim, you know, I've done like these five albums or whatever it was, and I've sent them to you through the years and we do a lot of your material. But I never heard from you and I was wondering what you thought and he goes, well, I'm glad you asked because I never would have told you, but you can't do my music that way. And I said, oh, and I said, uh, what? And he goes, that's not the way I wrote it. And I said, oh, oh, well, I work with jazz musicians and we always state your music exactly as you wrote it. And then we go off into these places. And I said, um, and he's like, you can't do that because people don't know my music. Uh, they're not, I, you know, I said, that's what jazz music we do with standards and stuff. It's like we interpret and he goes, no, no, you can't do that. And I said, oh, and he goes, you know, your pianist thinks that he knows better chords than I do. And I said, no, no, no. I said, please think of us as students, as, you know, these ardent fans who, because the place Kenny and I found our real connection in music was our love for dissonance. And of course, Sondheim uses that. So that's where we found a common ground. So I was like, please, please understand. Can you think of us as students, as acolytes, as you know, ardent fans who are writing themes on your compositions? He goes, no, I can't. And I don't ever want to hear you do that again. And I was like, okay, I assure you, I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> so I, he left. I was bereft, Melissa. I was beside myself. And I was just like, oh, you know, my heart was just so broken that he didn't get that I was honoring him with these interpretations. And I went back to my hotel in London, just like I was inconsolable. And I called Kenny in the States and it was like, you know, I don't know, like 
two or three in the morning or something. And he, he can he, and I was like, Kenny, Stephen Sondheim hates me. <laughs> you know, just crying and crying. And Kenny goes, I said, I told him we'd never do these arrangements again. He goes, wait a minute. You're telling me that after all the money you spent on these charts and all the work that we've done, you'll never do these again. And I stopped to think, and I was like, um, no, I, no, no, of course I'll do them. And he goes, um, when I told him that quote about <laughs> that, he said, my pianist knew better chords. He goes, I do. <laughs> Imbalance. It's it's going to be an imbalance. Oh, it was really such a crazy experience, but I don't know. I had some lovely experiences with him too. Like when I was doing uh, Into the Woods, uh, he brought me into a studio uh, in one day in rehearsal and said, "I wrote this for you," because everything I had was like patter songs and rap songs, and um, I was dying because I didn't have any soaring melodies to sing. And all the kids in the show, everybody else had their beautiful you know, moments to really do story songs that, you know, that I was really good at. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in this, my first even Sondheim show and I don't get to sing a soaring melody story song. And uh, he wrote this and it, it was Stay With Me. And right. I just, I just wept. I was like, oh, are you kidding? I, you know, I was just so honored. And he goes, yeah, I, you know, cause he knew I was longing for that. Mm -hmm. And so that was a real gift. And, and then another time I shared a cab with him <laughs> And uh, we were going to, you know, cross town to drop him on the east side. And I said, how do you do this? You know, how do you, how do you do this? It's like so amazing. And we all love you so with such a you know, totality. And he goes, oh, it's really my collaborators. And I was like, and he goes, yeah, Lapine just tells me what it's about and what he wants. And then I, right, I was like, oh my God. I mean, the guy, and then I had one other moment I came in as a sub for um, for a big concert that uh, they were doing at Carnegie Hall. His big, I think it was his seventy fifth birthday or something. And I was the only Broadway diva at that moment in time that was not invited. And it was this director and stuff. And um, so I was off doing Three Penny Opera in Williamstown, and I was kind of like. Jesus, you know, that's, I can't believe it. And yeah. I, I was in that show. Huh? I was with you at yeah. Williams. Oh, right. Of course. Um, so I, we, we were rehearsing. Mm -hmm. And so I get this call from my new young agent saying that this opera star had dropped out. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> didn't we do, we did Three Penny twice, right? I think so. Yeah. Right. We, we did twice with that I guy. Still, uh, yeah, director. I can't remember his name, but uh, uh, Hunt. This was the first time. We did it the second time together. I still have that little jewel box you gave me it's as an opening night gift. I have right next. It's a little ring box. I love it so much. So this was the first time. And um, so I asked Hunt if I could go. And he was like, no, no, no. And so I told my agent, they said, OK, well, we'll just play it by ear. Just wait the day of the rehearsals and stuff. So that I had one, um, I was called in and I did one rehearsal with the boys choir separately on a different day and one rehearsal with the symphony, but never with the symphony and the boys choir. So, cause I was up at Williamstown. And so they sent a car for me. And, uh, so when the time came to leave rehearsal, I went up to hunt and I said, Hey, you know, they're doing this concert at Carnegie hall. They needed me to come and sing. Is that okay? And he goes, Oh yeah. Cause previously it said no. And so, I kind of scooted out of rehearsal and was still learning um, that song, uh, Children Will Listen. And there was all these precise counts with the symphony arrangement and stuff. And I was like driving myself crazy, trying to count right and stuff. So I went and I was standing backstage at Carnegie Hall and all these, every diva that was there, you know, was there in their sequin gowns and their, their uh, personally, uh, written Jonathan Tunic arrangements that were written just for them. And I was inheriting this opera stars uh, arrangement of children will listen and our, our time, the Harlem boys choir was singing our time and I was singing children would listen. Thank God with the beautiful uh, Paul Gemignani as the conductor. And so the director wouldn't let me have a music stand, which just like, was like, why not? And cause I had was barely rehearsed. And he goes, no, no one else has them. I mean, the guy was like, whatever. 
And so um, I was standing backstage with the stage manager on stage left and the stage manager, she has this big score of music. And she said, uh, and I wasn't there for the, the sound check with everybody, right? Cause I was up at Williamstown. So she goes, I'll tell you when to go out. And I'm like, okay. Okay, the boys are singing and we're getting close to my entrance music, right? And she's like pulling through this like score of music. Like she doesn't know where she is. And, and I just tapped her on the shoulder. I said, I think I got to go out there now. And she goes, okay. So I go out and I see the audience and the place is packed and it's everybody who's anybody in opera and theater and musical theater. It was like so nerve wracking. I was terrified, absolutely terrified. And I walk out on stage and Gemignani and the orchestra's behind me. I mean, the symphony's behind me, no music stand. So nobody just say sing here, you know, it just like, it was like a singer's nightmare. And Gemignani looks at me and goes like this, gives me so much love as I'm walking on stage. And I just literally felt my heart just go, oh, you know, because he, I knew he would take care of me. It just, it still kills me to this day. I write him texts every now and then just to tell him how much I love him. He's conducted for me a few times and the guy is such an incredible person. So he really gave me this courage from across the stage, you know, and I started singing and oh, before I went out, I didn't have a seat. I had like slacks and a silk, white silk shirt because, you know, it was, it was, I didn't get a chance to get my beaded gown, quote unquote, for the event. And so I just felt like just such like such a stepchild stepping in, I was stepping into that situation. And my prayer was, fortunately, all the divas had left the dressing room by the time I was there to go on and um, was like, dear God, please, I'm not even asking for a good performance. I mean, or, you know, I just, please just let me finish the note when the boys and the orchestra finish, let me finish at the same time. And just let me do it. Let me not forget anything, please. Just let me do it properly. And so um, I went out there and I mean, I nailed that last note and finished right when they finished without a conductor waving me off. And I was like, oh, thank God. And the audience went nuts. And I was just so grateful, one, to be there and two, to like not just fall on my face. And then at the party afterwards, Sondheim comes up to me, goes, good job, good job. And he said, uh, by the way, um, Jerome Robbins came up to me and he said, that Betty Buckley is really beautiful. And I said, oh, thank you. And he goes, that's okay. You did a good job. And he walked away. <laughs> and then another time I had to sub at one of his birthday concerts for Bernadette, who dropped out at the last minute. And uh, uh, it was, you know, I was the guy that had to hand him the microphone and when they brought the cake out and stuff. And he looked at me like, what are you doing here? And I'm thinking to myself, I will always be wherever you are, oh great master. You know, I'm your devotee. It was just, I don't know. I have such a conflicted thing with him. Um, but anyway, that's just some of what I've experienced. You serve him beautifully. And he, he I think, uh, he had an evolution as a tough guy um, <laughs> through a certain era. Um, and I think I got a softer, a softer gentleman. Uh, by Good the for time. you. Yeah, actually, it sounds like good for me. Like I got lucky. Um, um, so finally, then, and the most impractical question I wanted to ask you, um, uh, and then you can tie this to your to your latest with your movie um, that you're doing. Let everybody know about it and how they can go and watch it. Um, so the, the the impractical question, like, why do we do it? I mean, what apart from the obvious, you know, career um, reasons uh, keeps us, you know, heads up and singing. Uh, through all the vagaries, you know, of our lives, was there is there a, uh, a key moment um, in in girlhood when you said this is what I want to do, and do you still feel that? Um, well, I knew from the time I sang in church from the time I was I was in the youth choir in church, and um, I used to love sound, and I would find culverts under highways and stuff where that were really echoey, and I was fascinated by the echo pockets i my voice is really meant for acoustic spaces where i can i know instinctively where to place my voice 
in a pocket of echo. And that's why I always need my own sound man, because it's not my voice, I don't think is easy to mix. And it's like the engineer get, doing the sound has to understand that. And so there's that. Um, and I was in love with sound and what I could do with my voice. And I studied all the great lady singers because my mom had a really vast record collection. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated that I could sing with the same resonance, mimicking them on the album and stuff like that on their albums. And one day when I was 13, I was standing in the back of our house looking out the window and there was a balcony on the back of my bedroom. And I saw this Wex Texas plane with this windmill and this cattle and I could hear this train over here in the distance and I just had this vision of who I would become when I was a grown up and what how my voice would uh, evolve and how it would affect people. And I knew that would happen and I knew it was going to be on Broadway. I was very, very clear about it. So uh, none of it was a surprise when I got my first Broadway show my first day in town. I'd done quite a few musicals at uh, our, our regional theater cost manana from the time I was 15. I was a professional and it was just what I did. It was just who I was almost, you know? Um, and so I knew when I was 35 and they brought me the recording of memory and I heard it, I was in my dressing room at the winter garden. I was like, Oh, that image, that vision came back when I was 13 of who I would become. And suddenly it was there and I was singing the way I knew I would learn to sing, which took a long time to learn how to do it properly. And fortunately, I studied with Paul to do that. Um, I've been thinking recently of writing some kind of short essay or something um, inspired by you and your writing um, about the dilemma or not dilemma, but the challenges of being an, elder, an older singer and how life changes you uh, and your physical changes your physicality one and also um your feelings about life change you know um that's and music needs to reflect that like the songs i pick need to reflect what i feel now not what i felt then although it was funny in singing memory again i realized this song that means so much to me that I think of as literally the jewel of my collection. I'm now the age that she was meant to be as a cat, you know, um, and though I was 35 at that point. And so here it is 41 years later, and I'm still singing her song. But now it's exactly I don't even have to act. It's like I know who she is so deeply. But she, Grizabella, was one of my great, great teachers. Um, you know, she taught me so learning how to sing her song properly and represent her properly in that space and time in 1982 um, was such a challenge. And she's she taught me everything that that character, that song brought me into finally to emerge, to step forward into the potential that I've been working with for a number of years and studying, 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 studying to learn to do it better. And um, and everything that I learned from Paul Gabbert and my spiritual teachers and psychologists and everybody I've worked with through the years, you know, it just all came together, it coalesced in that song and learning how to feel who Grizabella was, is. She to this day is my soulmate and my, I would say one of my dearest friends. So whenever I sing her song, it's so, She's an exquisite being, and, and I really am grateful that I got to represent her. Um, so there's that. Amazing. What an amazing story. Um, I never could have expected uh, uh, some of your answers. Absolutely beautiful. You know, nothing, nothing like uh, the, the depth of uh, relationship that you have, but the, the original Eliza Doolittle was my age. Uh, oh, you're right. Mrs. Patrick Campbell was in her early 50s when George Bernard Shaw fell in love with her and wrote Eliza. So in a very, very small way, I understand that uh, a character can can define your life or, or continue to evolve as you evolve. But nobody evolves more than Betty Buckley mm. um, as an artist. And you still stay fresh and uh, available and passionate. And um, so... 
I love you, Melissa. And I love, I love watching you evolve too, as a singer from when you, when I first met you, when you were very young on Broadway and, and I met you at Joan's studio and stuff. And I, I've always loved watching the, the journey of your career as an actress and your evolution as a singer and who you are today just inspires me very much. Some point I'd love to know what, what about our conversation today surprised you? That would be interesting for me to know. We hang up the Zoom, I'll tell you, but, um, but so many things will surprise a lot of people and delight and teach. Um, uh, it is a life to be an actress. You know, I came up in a different era and the people who are listening are probably facing a lot of different things than we faced. Uh, I, I didn't come up in a time where musical theater was as, as vibrant um, and I lived through uh, different things. Every, every era um, is, is different, but it's still a good life, you know, to be an actress. So anyway, I'm going to say thank you. It's just wonderful to be a part of the community. So thank you. And thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Melissa.